And so I think we are right on time. Anne, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Anoop. And speaking of being ready for clinical trials, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Anne Berg. Dr. Berg is a professor at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine and is really a, a household name when it comes to epilepsy, causes of epilepsy, natural history of epilepsy, and really bringing rigorous clinical science to the discipline of clinical trial readiness. And so we are really excited to hear from you, Dr. Berg, about how we can think about outcomes and really talking about measuring meaningful outcomes for people with lennox gusto syndrome. Well, thank you. Um, it's wonderful. And I'm just experiencing a tiny bit of confusion with my screen. I thought I had this worked out. Can you see my screen okay? We can. Thanks. We can. Okay. I'll just leave it at that then. Um, I thought I had worked out how I could. Ah. No, that's not. Just a minute. All right, we'll just go with what we have. All right, well, first of all, it's really delightful to be here, and I'm um, very grateful to the Lennox Gusto Syndrome Foundation and the organizers for um, inviting me to speak about something that I think is really critical, and that is um, what does better look like if we want to improve the outcomes for people with Lennox Gusto Syndrome? What are we trying to improve, and how will we know if we get there? I'm going to organize this talk or have some themes going through this talk. It's a series of questions, and some of them have already been considered. What is Lennox Gusto syndrome? What are we trying to make better? Which outcomes do we target for disease modifying therapies? What does better look like? Why do we care? And that's an important question. And where do we start? Um, Lennox Gusto syndrome, as we all know, and as you've already heard, is a very severe refractory form of epilepsy. And the treatment of Lennox Gusto syndrome has followed the typical approach, the traditional approach to treating epilepsy, which is seizure suppression. You suppress the seizures at the source, it's largely etiology, etiology agnostic, and you just try one seizure medication after another with little evidence for which one to choose next. The trials of Lennox Gusto syndrome have been performed. There are specific drugs recommended for Lennox Gusto syndrome based on these trials, but these trials have never demonstrated magnificent results. This, for example, is, and they're beautifully done trials by very skilled trialists, but these are the results from the rufinamide trial. And if we look at the tonic and atonic seizures, you can see that um, in the rufinamide group, the net uh, reduction in seizures was about 1.2 seizures a day. In the placebo group, it was only about 0.5 seizures a day. So, you know, overall, there was a, a, a net gain, a net improvement of about 0.5 seizures less per day with treatment. It's better, but not brilliant. In the recent CBD trial, we see similar results. Those with the placebo in the placebo group had a net reduction in seizures of about 1.2 seizures per day. Those in the 10 and 20 milligram group had a net reduction of 2.2 or 2.4 seizures a day. So a net improvement over placebo of about one seizure less a day. It's better, but it's not life changing. And in terms of complete response, um, defined as complete elimination of big seizures, the atonic tonic seizures or drop seizures, um, only a few people actually had a complete elimination of all these seizures. These are not game changing medications. We are now, though, in the age of precision medicine, and the idea here is that we use information about people's genes and environment to prevent, diagnose, and treat disease. But what is Lennox Gusto syndrome? As you've already heard from all my colleagues before me, it is not a disease in the traditional sense. There is no single established biological cause and it's really due to a multitude of injuries and conditions that derail the developing nervous system. It is an electroclinical symptom, syndrome with a collection of signs and symptoms. Few or none are absolute, although from Elaine Worrell's talk, it seems that there are some core symptoms that are now gaining traction. But if we look through the literature over the years, the definitions vary. They involve refractory seizures, multiple seizure types, varying as to whether drop seizures have to be there or tonic. Uh, we, we now require tonic. 
EEG features, which are there at some point, but maybe not there throughout uh, the lifespan, and then developmental delay and intellectual disability. The definition has been fairly flexible um, and has really been flexible to suit the, the needs of drug, um, of drug trials. You've already heard a couple of people talk about developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, and this is a term that's been around for a long time um, and used in various ways to refer to a form of epilepsy. But Helen Cross and I, as part of the ILAE terminology and classification process, reclaimed that term and we redefined it to mean that it that the epileptic activity itself or something about that activity actually contributes to behavioral and cognitive disorders above and beyond any compromise that could be attributed to the underlying lesion or condition itself and the developmental piece of this is that the this occurs during the development of function during critical periods in brain development Um, to give you a heuristic understanding of this, I once heard a wonderful talk by Dr. ben Ari, and he, he talked about how the new brain learns, learns, how a neuron learns, and he talked about the song of the young neuron, and he described a newly formed neuron chirping and sending out little processes and signals and just sort of chirping there by itself. And then at one point, another neuron chirps back. And these neurons chirp back and forth to each other and others join them and eventually you have a song which turns into the symphony of mature brain activity. In a developmental epileptic encephalopathy, you have this epileptic cacophony that's going off in the developing brain and interfering with the development of that song. And instead of the beautiful symphony, you get this. That's heuristic. This has now been quantified and is studyable. Um, you're going to hear a whole session this afternoon about brain networks, but this is one of the first papers where I became aware of this, and it comes from John Archer's group. I, I believe Dr. Archer is speaking this afternoon. And what they have demonstrated is that in this process of epileptic encephalopathy, the brains of people with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome actually get rewired. And what's demonstrated here is that intra- um, intra intra region connectivity and inter region connectivity, intra region and inter region connectivity is actually changed. And these are areas of the brain where the Lennox Gastaut brain is wired differently than the typical brain. What is the result of that? Oh, and this is a disease then. We, we can consider it perhaps a disease of aberrant brain wiring. What is the result of this? In human terms, you already know about the seizures. These are data from a um, scoping natural history project that the Lennox Gastaut uh, families took part in. For the past week, 70% reported daily seizures. Only one patient did not have any seizures that week. When seizures occur, it's not just one or two, it's multiple daily seizures. Most had two to 10, and then there are many who had even more than that. And as Tracy said, it's death and crisis that they're worried about. 30% had been in the emergency department, 15% multiple times because of a seizure just in the last six months. But it goes far beyond that. You've heard about de uh, development and cognitive impairment, but it's even more than that. From that scoping survey, we were able to ascertain how many people were completely dependent in terms of basic daily functions. Um, in the numbers here, you see the proportion of patients who could not walk, could not feed themselves, could not grasp something with their hands, could not communicate with their parents or their caregivers, didn't have any words, were completely dependent for toileting needs. And in the light green at the top, you can see the proportion who had at least some moderate degree of independence, although I would never say that their function was entirely typical or normal. Can we envision the treatment for this? Obviously, that's what we're here to talk about today, and it would involve network modulation. And it struck me that we've been so focused on seizures that we stop, we stop thinking about what other people in other areas of the neurosciences do. And isn't this kind of what psychiatry does with their medications for attention deficit disorder, depression, anxiety, and so forth? So it is possible, but that's going to be into the future. And as Heather Method said, we want to be ready when that time comes. So what do we want to target 
to make better the normix gusto syndrome. Obviously the seizures, and we've been trying to do that, but that doesn't work so well. We have the severe to profound intellectual disability, communication impairment, the gross motor impairment, fine motor impairment, the dysregulated sleep. When the somatic nervous system is this profoundly impaired, the autonomic nervous system is as well. GI issues are a major concern as for cardiorespiratory, but pretty much everything across the board. There are endocrine problems, eating disorders, and, and eating disability, and behavioral manifestations, and there are probably others I haven't even considered here. What do we want to target to make better? And the FDA has considered this, we'll talk a bit about, more about that in a moment, but in their guidance to industry, they have pointed out that drug trials should be focus on um, features of the disease that are important to patients or caregivers, and these are aspects that are most likely to be life-limiting or life-altering. So how do you figure that out? You don't go to the doctor. You've got to go to the patient community and find out what is important. What are they living with? And then focus on critical outcomes. Is it sleep? Is it communication? Is it gait? Is it something else? But think about what, if you could change it, would make the child better, the caregiver better, and the family better. Now, what people will do is a quick survey and say, okay, they said uh, communication, and then they will go to the outcomes measures boutique and go shopping for a, a nice quick and dirty communication measure or gait measure or behavior measure, and then go and use it. Please don't do that. These are data from the Simon Searchlight Project, and I was able to, with the um, help of the Families SC and 2A um, Foundation, get a hold of their data and analyze it. Um, for that cohort, 64 programs with SCN2A associated neurodevelopmental disorders, most with epilepsy, uh, median age 49 months, so just about four years old. And in the Simons project, they administered the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales to everyone. And we got those measures. And what we found was in this group, the average um, measures were in the mid 50s. Now this is scaled something like an IQ test, so the average should be 100 and the standard deviation is 15. This is performance that is minus three standard deviations below the mean. Let's just review the normal distribution. It looks like this. This would be a distribution of anything in the population, height, weight, intelligence, and two-thirds of the population falls within one standard deviation of the mean. So this would be average, high average, low average. If we go out to two standard deviations, we have 95.4%. And if we go out to three standard deviations, we have 99.7%. That means 0.3% of the population, half of that bit falls up here, more than three standard deviations above, and half more, more than three standard deviations below. That's about 1.5 per thousand people. We're dealing with rare diseases, but not only are we dealing with rare diseases, we're dealing with rare outcome classes. What is a meaningful change in this minus three standard deviations below the mean, and how do we measure it? What instruments do we use? And why do we care? Let me point out that in order to get a drug through and approved, we have to demonstrate that it works. And we usually do that in the context of some kind of randomized trial. You know, we get we get a group of patients, there are definitions for which patients can be in, which which would be excluded. They're randomized, they receive a new therapy versus the standard therapy or a placebo, and then we follow them over time for outcome. And the outcome may be seizures, then they're done that, or it might be non-seizure outcomes. And then we perform an analysis and we hope the results support the efficacy of the drug. And if the results do, then we can go to the FDA and perhaps the drug will be approved and that would be nice. But what if we do the analysis and the results don't support efficacy? It's much harder to get approval because you haven't demonstrated the drug is helpful. This is not a theoretical concern. This is exactly what happened with the Arbaclofen trial for Fragile X syndrome. In this trial, the investigators, and these are really good neurobehavioral um, investigators, 
used as their primary endpoint the aberrant behavior checklist irritability scale. And they found no difference at all between treated and untreated patients. They had some secondary endpoints, none of which showed a huge amount of difference. In their post hoc analysis, though, they found that the aberrant behavior checklist social avoidance scale was actually very, um, that the drug was very efficacious when measured with, with that particular outcome. And this, this was a really hard one um, for everyone. Um, the investigators reflected that the selection of the irritability scale was driven by a US FDA precedent. The FDA knew this instrument, and my understanding is probably recommended it. Um, and they said that their study's failure on this endpoint might have been the result either of a mistaken choice of endpoint or, or a true lack of drug effect. Uh, we won't know. And unfortunately, I, I believe this drug has been left in limbo since then. So it's a long journey before you get to do a trial. You want to be sure that at the end, you haven't short, shorted yourself on outcome consideration. So it's probably not um, uh, coincidental that the FDA started right around the same time as the back backup and trial was published um, to issue their guidance to industry regarding uh, rare disease uh, drug development. And among other things that they pointed out was the need to have a sensitive clinical in endpoint in your trial. So we know for the people who are in the average range um, how to measure steps going from good to better to best. But when we're talking about people who have lennox gastaut syndrome and other very severe neurodevelopmental disorders, we need to measure what's going on down here. And as two of my favorite people, Gabby Conacher and Julietta Hacker from Deep Connection said, we don't need to measure milestones. We need to measure inch stones. How are we going to do that? What instruments do we use? It takes a bit of research. We need to identify and evaluate, adapt, or maybe create de novo appropriate measures that work in that population, that separate people out, that make sense, that are relevant. And there are ways to do that. In our natural history survey, we just started asking people, can your child walk? Can your child communicate? Just figuring out those basic um, blocks, but then we also did a lot of work on the appropriateness of questions and questionnaires or our own. Um, we asked questions like, am I asking you the right question? Uh, can you answer the question with the choices I've given you? Do you understand what I'm asking? And we got wonderful feedback from people, things like, don't give us the Vineland. Our kids can't do that stuff. Ask us things that are relevant to our kids. Um, ask us what we understood in your question. Don't ask if something's a problem. Everything's a problem. My child just had was in status last night. Two doses of rescue meds didn't work. We ended up in the ED. Now he's in the PICU. My whole life's a problem. This is an irritating way of asking a question. Ask us why our kids do or don't do something. I was um, I learned a lot from one parent who, when I, I asked her if her child could cut her food with a fork and knife, thinking I was asking about motor control, she said, hmm. Maybe, but she has rage attacks, so we don't let her have a knife. What I was asking her about was opportunity and adaptive behavior and how her environment had been structured to account for her other difficulties. And then something that's very important to parents, and I don't know how we build this into questionnaires or assessments, but they really want to talk about variability. They can say, yeah, sometimes he can do that, but other times not. When he's had seizures, he can't. When he's just come off rescue meds, we're in trouble if he's had a bad night's sleep. So there's a lot of variability in what it is we try to measure and we have to be aware of that. Um, we went on from a natural history scoping survey to the ability study and this we're, we're still working on analyzing this. But this is a one time survey and parents reported on a variety of measures of function. We had 125 young people participate including 36 with one Gastaut syndrome their chronological age at the time of the surgery, uh, at the time of the survey was 10.8 years. 75% um, were seven and older. The youngest, I think, was about four. We used a measure called the Adaptive Behavior Assessment System. It's similar to the Vineland, but we 
use the zero to five form, not the full form into adulthood, but the zero to five form where we have greater granularity for the very young ages. And this is what we found. In this group, the median scores reflect function in the one to two year old range. Now remember, let's put that next to their chronological age. Here they are up here in, in actual age, and here they are down here in terms of how we can measure them. I do want to put a, a small caution in. Um, this is very rough to say it's age equivalent. A 20-year-old um, with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome who is functioning at a two-year level is very different from a two-year-old. Um, in many ways, a two-year-old is actually much more capable of things. Um, on the other hand, a 20-year-old with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome is, is an adult and has other experiences, so does things that a two-year-old doesn't do. So it's not that just that we can take these measures and apply them, but this gives us an idea of where, uh, what range we're working in. So you saw that. The other thing that we can do is create de novo new instruments. And this was done with great effect in the NCL literature, where a very simple, very robust measure of, of a degeneration in that kind of disease was developed that was a, a four point scale from zero to three for motor function, normal rather to three to zero, um, to immobile and for language function, three normal to unintelligible. These were added for altogether six points, zero to six. And this exquisitely defined the course of degeneration over time in these children with this dreadful disease so well that it was used, um, the FDA actually allowed the historical natural history data to stand in um, for the, as the comparison group in an active um, treatment trial of about 24 children with this ultra rare condition. Works really well there. Um, in the Rett syndrome space, investigators have developed a Rett syndrome behavioral questionnaire this is a very thoughtful um, article. The, the, the people who made this, the questionnaire were actually a little bit um, unsure that it was working as well as they hoped. Some of the psychometric properties were not as good as um, needed for, for a randomized trial. And it's very thoughtful and also points out how difficult this can be. And of course, I think you're all aware that the Angelman syndrome community has come up with the ORCA, or the Observed Reported Communication Ability Measure. Um, which has been developed in the Angelman group, and it is now being trialed and perhaps adapted for other DEE groups. And that's, that will be exciting to see how that works. Whatever we do, we can have a great measure, but we should try it in the intended population. Um, the ability study gave us uh, an idea of what measures to use and how they worked. And based on that, we're now doing a clinical trials readiness study with the SCN2A um, Family Foundation. You could say that's SCN2A, right? Yeah, it is, but a quarter of those children have diagnoses of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So this is actually very relevant for the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome foundation. What I'd like to do is just give you a really brief snapshot of the kind of data that are coming out. And I don't wanna to go too much into them, um, because they are extremely preliminary, but they're based on the first, first tranche of um, patients who have been in the study. These are the scores for 25 children uh, using a typical standardized score of an important function. And you can see that all, except this very last one, just barely off the threshold, all were at the absolute lowest. This is minus st five standard deviations below the mean. And if someone is down that low, how are you going to measure, even if they improve a little bit, they may never get off that floor. Using an alternative measure of the same function in the same patient though, this is what we start to see. We actually can get down there below the floor and study it. It's almost like you know, if you see a drop of water, you say, okay, it's a drop of water. It's down there on the floor. What's to it? You know, you can't get any further down than that. And I can't really understand it any better than that. But with the right instrument, perhaps a microscope, you might begin to appreciate all that is going on inside that drop of water. We need the right behavioral microscope 
to study these outcomes in children and young people for Lennox Gusto syndrome. Finally, and this is really important, we have to get the results out into the scientific community so people become familiar with the instruments, the FDA gets to know the instruments, and there's general buy-in for their use. Using what's already on the shelf the way it's already been used is not getting us anywhere. We need to go further. So I hope I've given you an idea of um, my passion for this and, and why I think it's important. And the Lennox Gusto community is going to have to decide what it wants to focus on in terms of change. And then we have to ask, what scale are we on? The last thing we want to do is show up to measure a mountain with an electron microscope or take surveying equipment into the laboratory to study neuronal processes. We need the right measuring tape for your children. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Berg. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. I think one of the questions that, that I have that many of us have is should we be thinking about developmental developmentally appropriate outcome measures for children with a syndrome like Lennox Gusto syndrome that is so well defined as we've heard about in many ways, or should we really be going the way of specific gene based developmental and other outcome measures, which, you know, both of which you've done so nicely. So I don't know if you want to weigh in yeah. on what you think we're going. That's, that's an fantastic question. It's the crux of things because people want to come out with our each group wants its own measure. And as I showed you, the, these children, um, I showed you Lennox Gusto, a little bit of, of, um, of SCN2A, they're at the very bottom. And there's only a certain repertoire available down there. So I think there are commonalities that reach across all of these disorders. That said, something like Rett syndrome that's also extremely well-defined and has some very strong particular peculiarities may need its own its own measures the the language the hand stereotypies um may actually be subject to to more specific disease focused um to outcomes it's I, I think what we need to do is start using some broad but appropriate measures across multiple groups we tried that a bit in the ability study and the, those data are coming out i promise um between talks um and then we need to see if that's enough. And the individual groups also have to start talking within themselves and across each other to see if, if their goals are similar or if they have very specific needs. 